This program was made with the support of the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland. James Hack Took was a Quaker. He undertook to come to Ireland and to do everything he could to help the poor of Ireland. He was trying to improve the lives of people here. He seemed to be a very compassionate man. He felt he should do something, so he devised this scheme. James Hack Took and his assisted immigration schemes. Shipping the starving Irish to, to the New World. America was absolutely crying out for labour at that stage. They wouldn't have had a hope unless the assisted immigration was involved. You had to want to go. It wasn't sort of a, an obligatory thing. So you had a choice. The Chuuk Fund allowed the people to emigrate with dignity. Such a large population left the area between 1882 and 1884. Between a two and a three year period, the numbers that leave are just phenomenal. The Chuuk scheme presented a legitimate get-out clause, if you like, for these people to start again and build a new life for themselves. The people on the ships cheered him to the gunnels. They were happy to be going. They all just took off and delighted to get going because there was nothing here for money, destitution and debt. It was incredibly successful. In the early 1880s, many parts of Ireland, in particular the west of Ireland, were struck by famine. In consequence, many Irish people found themselves mired in destitution and facing certain death, unless someone intervened to help them. And it was in an effort to help these poorest of the Irish poor that in 1881 an English Quaker named James Hack Chook initiated an assisted emigration scheme which became known as the Chook Fund. Over a three-year period, Chooks Fund assisted over 9,000 Irish people to emigrate from their famine-ravaged communities in Ireland to North America. Now we'll hear more shortly about the Chook Fund, but first here's a historian Joan Johnson of the Society of Friends to explain James Chook's roots. James H. Chook came from York and he was the son of Samuel and Priscilla Chook and they, Samuel was in tea and coffee business but both he and his wife were very interested in the welfare of the community and had been involved in setting up schools and Samuel had a connection with Ireland and used to employ the Irish men labourers coming over in early days. They also were instrumental in setting up the retreat which is a, a Quaker mental hospital is still run today. But James, he went to Bootham Quaker School in York, a um, well-known school there, uh, which is still running, and joined the, the family business. And given James Chuke's strong social conscience, it's perhaps not surprising that when the Great Famine struck Ireland in the mid-1840s, the 27-year-old Chuuk volunteered to go on a fact-finding mission to the famine-ravaged areas in the west of Ireland. Joan Johnson. He was in York and at that time, 1846-ish, he was asked to join an investigative tour with William Foster and his son William Edward Foster to tour the west of Ireland where they were looking at the famine and the destitution at the time and James Chuuk came. So he visited Ireland for the first time in December of 1846. James Chook was aghast at the famine devastation which he witnessed in the west of Ireland. Christine Keneally, director of Ireland's Great Hunger Institute, situated in Quinnipiac University, Connecticut. He was devastated by what he saw time and time again. He described people um, in Connacht as being living skeletons and as crying with hunger. So again, very graphic um, descriptions of what was happening. And after visiting various famine-ravaged areas in Ireland, 
James Chook and other Quakers wrote up reports of their tour. These reports were instrumental in helping to dispel myths then circulating in much of the British press that the Irish were exaggerating the harshness of the famine. Joan Johnson. They compiled uh, this report, which was the first Quaker report out of the west of Ireland. Uh, it, It spread through Quaker circles and got the campaign up and running, as it were. So Chuk played an important part for that. He visited then again in the autumn of 1847, and he wrote his own account, which is called A Visit to Connacht. It was a very comprehensive observations, not only of the destitution, but the causes and the remedies. And while in Ireland, James Chook also helped to set up soup kitchens, distribute vegetable seeds to those who were still able to till the land, and also helped to establish a fishing station. Eventually, he returned to his native York City in England. Christine Keneally. James went back, he returned to his family business in Yorkshire, but again he took that compassion with him and he decided to open relief hospitals for the Irish poor who had emigrated, who had fled from the famine, yet fled to find in some ways very unsympathetic receptions both in Britain and in America. And so he opened, helped to open hospitals for these poor people. And in fact, he himself caught famine fever, but he recovered. It was called the Irish fever in Britain at the time, but he was a young man, he was 27, 28, and he did recover. And although James Chuke did recover, nevertheless his bout of Irish fever permanently damaged his health for the remainder of his life. Over the next three decades he became an extremely successful and wealthy banker in his native England. Also throughout this period the plight of Ireland's West continued to capture his soul. When famine once again struck the west of Ireland in the early 1880s, James Chook made it his business to do something practical to help. Jerry Morn, associate of the Centre for Irish Studies in NUI Galway and also author of the book Sending Out Ireland's Poor, assisted emigration to North America in the 19th century. Chook comes to Ireland in February of 1880. There are reports emanating from December 1879 and January 1880 of a major crisis, um, you know, especially in the west of Ireland. By February of 1880, there are one million people surviving on relief that is giving out. The Society of Friends you know, decide to send a small group, which includes James Hackchuk and his nephew. In February of 1880, he decides that he's going to visit Donegal and the west of Ireland. On his journey, he's he's absolutely horrified by actually what he sees, that in many of the areas that he he travels to, that the distress is as bad, if not worse. And I've put it in a context for you. The failure of the potato crop in 1879 and 1880 is actually worse than the failure of the potato crop in 1847, because the yield is only 1.4 tonnes per acre. Um, Now, it's highly significant in place in the poorer parts of you know, the west of Ireland and Donegal, purely on account of the fact that the reliance of the potato is still very, very high. When Chu came to visit, he found an area that was really in a very poor state. It hadn't been as, as bad or as badly affected since the time of the famine. Kathleen Villiers Tuttle, Connemara historian and author of the book The Great Famine in Connemara. The people were in near starvation. They, for several years there had been bad weather, poor harvests, and the people were in arrear of rents. They were now dependent on the, the uh, poor law union to supply them with food, and they were just in a very, very bad condition. They were in debt to the local shops, they were in debt to the landlord, and there seemed very little possibility of things improving in the near future for them. James Chuk realised this fact. He also knew that the people who were worst affected were those who'd been evicted and were left without a proper roof over their heads. Joan Johnson. He had witnessed the evictions and he felt that there was 
a group of, of society that was right at the very bottom of, of the pile, as it were, that had no hope whatsoever. Some people could pay their rents to the, the landlords, but then there was a group underneath that were just so struggling and they were the ones that were actually destined for for starvation and, and death. And he saw that and that touched his heart, I'd say. He seemed to be a very compassionate man and uh, he felt he should do something. So he devised this scheme. And having researched the matter carefully, James Chook devised a scheme, funded at first by private donations, by which entire families would be assisted to emigrate to the United States and Canada. Christine Keneally. He realised that people were not being helped to emigrate. He saw emigration as a great palliative for what was happening. And he sort of brought his experience as a relatively young man to bear on this second great famine in Ireland. So he returned to Ireland the early 1880s and he decided that the best way he could help Ireland and these poor people on a permanent basis was to help them to emigrate. But not in the crazy, unregulated, cruel way that so many people had emigrated during the Great Famine, but really in a regulated manner, in a planned manner, with both their destinations being thought out in advance, with them being provided with enough food to survive the journey, and with enough money to survive being in a strange society for a few months. So it was a very different form of emigration from what took place during the Great Famine. And to get his assisted emigration scheme up and running, Chuk first visited the New World in the summer of 1880 in order to establish the necessary support systems for the Irish emigrants which he planned to help send there, Jerry Morn. What he does is, during the summer of 1880, he goes off to North America and he visits the Midwest Midwestern states, which at this stage are being opened up because of the coming of the railways, especially in places like Wisconsin, uh, Nebraska, and in particular Minnesota. But he also goes to the Midwestern states in Canada, to Winnipeg and Manitoba in particular. Now, while he's there, he also comes in contact with government officials in Canada. Uh, he meets the Prime Minister of Canada, John A. Macdonald, and he gets a commitment from them that if he starts an immigration scheme, that the Canadian authorities are going to look at and help those immigrants who come in to the port of Quebec, send them to those destinations where they will be helped, where uh, there is work available, and that, in general, help them to settle in. But he also gets this commitment in the Midwest from people like you know, Bishop John Ireland. Well, stateside, Chug, before the, immig uh, the immigration schemes were initiated, he had actually made a trip to America himself and he had built these contacts. Historian Regina Donnan of NUI Minute. That was incredibly important to the success of the scheme. But he has also ensured, um, which was different from other assisted immigration schemes, he had ensured that there was enough money available to send the immigrants to their onward destinations. And so they weren't just dropped in the port cities in a, in a friendless environment where they it was sink or swim, quite literally. Um, they, they were cared for enough by Chuk and, and the organisers of the scheme that they were actually um, brought to their onward destinations as part of the, as part of the scheme. He was prepared to put in the legwork. He did it in America in that they had a place to go to. They had a definite destination to go to, a town, a village, accommodation and work to go to. And that's where it all counts. It's about this small detail. County Mayo local historian John Gallagher. Here's historian Christine Keneally to once again share her views. There is no doubt that he planned it. It was a very systematic approach. It really stands up, I think, as... Um, a prototype of how to help people to emigrate, what needs to be done in terms of planning before they go, during the journey and when they arrive. 
So because these are people who were dislocated at that time even, many of them would have been Irish speakers. It wasn't just individuals who were going in this famine scheme, emigration scheme, but whole families. So different people within the family would have had different needs. So again, he brought his considerable experience, his compassion, his contacts at this stage. He's a much older man to bear on this. Vital among James Chook's contacts were those many influential MPs and wealthy businessmen that he knew in the British establishment. On the 31st of March in the year 1882, they came together at an informal meeting in London to raise £8,000 for assisted emigration from Ireland, as well as to form the Chook Committee, Jury Morn. The functions of the Chook Committee, or the aims of it, as set out at that meeting, was that a fund would be established in order to put in place emigration from the west of Ireland. Only families would be assisted. And there was a reason for this. The reason was, okay, if you took whole families away, then you would leave land available, which then could be redistributed amongst the existing population, so that their holdings would be bigger and their farms would become much more viable. Put this in context... In Balmullet Porlo Union, nearly three quarters of the farms were under 15 acres, regarded by the Bessburg Commission in its report in 1881 as economically unviable. So the idea was that only families would be helped and would be sent out. You also would have to have a large number of breadwinners in the families, but important as well, at least one of the family members would have to have English. On account of the fact the vast majority of these immigrants were going to come from the west of Ireland from Irish-speaking areas, so it was important that you would have an English speaker in their midst. The idea was that it would be assisted emigration. Historian John Johnson. So that the people wouldn't just be given their ticket and left off uh, on the ship, but they would ap- apply, they would be chosen uh, and put on a list, and they would be given support. And that support was the travel ticket. It, but also it would be travel from the place where they le- were, were leaving. So the, most of the, the, the first group went were from the Clifton Union. Now, we collaborated with the Clifton Union and because they were the people who knew who, who was the worst off and who wanted to come and so he came over and he met the officer in Clifton Union. The reason why Clifton Porlo Union was selected was on account of the fact that the Porlo Guardians about four weeks previously had agreed that they would seek a loan of £2,000 towards an immigration scheme from the area. Historian Jerry Morn. The reason why they wanted to implement an immigration scheme was there had been large scale evictions that had taken place in which about 1,500 people were on the side of the road in Clifton with no proper accommodation. They had been evicted from the estates like the Burridge estate, the Eyre estate, etc. So they wanted to get rid of this population that was a drain on the resources of the poor law. It was as a result of this that Chuke decided to head to Clifton. He goes to Clifton and he finds that okay, the cooperation amongst the officials is superb. They're prepared to work with them, but they're also prepared to send the relieving officers to help to identify families that would be most in need of going. In addition to this, he also gets help from local clergymen, in particular Catholic clergymen, because there are quite a number of clergymen in Connemara and in Mayo at this particular stage, who are actually advocating emigration because they see the dire circumstances under which their parishioners are living. Some of these are like Father Patrick Greeley, the administrator of Karna, who is probably the first one who alerts the world to the crisis in Karna at the beginning of January in 1880. But most of these priests are prepared to help and prepared to identify the particular individual's that should leave. So what Chuk does is he spends 10 days just going around the Porlo Union with the relieving officers, being introduced to 
the parish priests, and then been told of potential families that needed to be assisted to go out. Within a matter of two weeks, he has nearly 1,300 individuals who have signed up who want to be helped to go to North America. He was working, I suppose, on all fronts. Karen Mannion, a leader worker with Forum Connemara. I'm a leader worker and we were involved in, in what they call the bottom up approach um, to, to community development and that's where communities actually, you know, the, the, the whole plan, the, the, what they want from their community, what their life, the, what, the shape they want their life to take comes literally from the bottom up rather than, you know, usually central government top down. James Hack took was using that bottom-up approach. He was talking to the people on the ground. He was particularly um, interested in what the uh, clergy had to say, you know, the Catholic clergy, um, what they had to say, because there was a number of parish priests very seemed to have been very concerned about their care, their flock, and wanted a better life for them. So that was very interesting, that, you know, the religious boundaries didn't seem to come into it at all. He goes and meets the potential immigrants along with the relieving officers or along with the parish priests. He then interviews them. They're then selected. They then have to be fitted out. They then have to be medically examined because this was to ensure that they all arrived in a healthy state. So the process from the time that they actually were first encountering Chuk right up to the time that they leave the boat because of virtually every occasion he travels with the emigrants to Galway and sees them off on the boat. So that the amount of time, the amount of energy, the amount of commitment is just phenomenal. And remember, he has a merchant bank as well at this stage that has to be looked after. So that what he's doing is he is showing his total commitment, probably at the expense to a certain extent, of his own business in order to help people in the west of Ireland. And as Jerry Morn touched on earlier, a key tenet of the Chuk scheme was that it specifically assisted families and not individuals. Kathleen Villiers, Tuttle. In the Chuk case, he took families, whole families, so that meant that they weren't leaving anybody behind. They were bringing everybody with them. In some cases, they were bringing the grandmothers, and in a lot of cases, they were even bringing the mothers-in-law, they were bringing the sisters-in-law. So they were trying to include as many people as possible so that they probably weren't leaving. And think about it. What were they leaving behind? A sod-up hovel in the side of the road? Was, were you going to weep for it? I wonder. You know, I don't think so. But And particularly if your whole family came with you. So that was the one difference. And historian Joan Johnson once again shares her views. Took, really, he said, right, families was the first thing, to keep the families together. So the uh, Clifton Workhouse made this list of the families uh, as as the first initiative and uh, they would be given help to get down to the boat in Galway. Their, their lodgings would be paid the night before and the ticket would be bought for them and clothing was also provided. They were given vouchers to go into Clifton to buy an outfit for the journey so that when they landed in America, because they had nothing, I mean, they had nothing. They hadn't shoes or anything, or warm clothes, so that that was taken care of. So the detail that Duke had had thought out to make this a successful project uh, for them. He saved the starving from the doom of famine every day. The English Quaker came to save the poor. The impoverished and destitute he saved in every way When eviction knocked on many a humble door He was born to help the poorest and the needy His parents, they were all so true and kind 
He never stopped in helping with compassion every day To give the less well of some peace of mind From a caring Quaker home he came with a kind and loving heart For welfare of the poor was his desire to the west he travelled when he heard of famine's evil curse For his flame of compassion burned like fire He toured the west to investigate the famine and the poor The scenes he witnessed were to horrify with families eating seaweed from a bleak and barren shore Where thousands without help would surely die Families were the important thing and so the first group that went out, um, I mean he describes in, in his report how they all got down to Galway and uh, I could see it was chaos really, organised chaos because there were a lot of children there and they had to get it to Galway onto the quay, get a tugboat out into the to the bay where the boat was arriving uh, and waiting and it was early in the morning, it was about 7am so if you can imagine they were up and out and and a lot of them were very apprehensive. You know, they were, it was quite a big thing for them to be actually make the decision to actually get up and go. And then they'd heard stories about America and would they make it over there? And so there was a lot of apprehension. In total, nearly 1,300 people left Ireland for North America in the first year of the Tuke Scheme in 1882. As a result of the scheme's phenomenal success that first year, the Tuke Committee got official government support to expand the scheme. Jerry Morn. It is as a result of this, in 1882, £100,000 is made available for assisted emigration from all along the western seaboard under the 1882 Arrears of Rent Act. Now, in 36 of the Poor Law Unions, the Boards of Guardians and the Local Government Boards have been asked to administer the schemes. But Chuk is asked to administer the schemes in four Poor Law Unions, which are regarded as the most destitute along the western seaboard. These are Clifton, Uchtarard, Balmullet and the western part of Newport Poor Law Union. In other words, Ackle, Curran and the area west of Newport Town. What is decided at this stage by the committee is that they are going to appoint administrators in the different Polo unions. Duke is going to continue in Clifton. A Major Gaskell is going to take over the operations in Uchtarard. And in the two Polo unions in Mayo, Balmullet and Newport, that Rutledge Fair is going to look after these. Now, what they do is they largely continue what had been put in place in Clifton in 1882. It was very, very easy to do this in Clifton, largely on account of the fact that they had use of the relieving officers, they had the support of the Catholic clergy, they also had the, the different uh, merchants who provided the different um, clothing, etc. Uh, so all of that was now being replicated in Uchtarard and in the Balmullet, etc. The significance largely can be seen in that in Balmullet, the whole thing takes off and takes off exponentially in terms of the numbers of people who are now applying for to be sent out. In the second year of the Chuke Scheme in 1883, over 5,000 people left Ireland for North America. Over 3,000 of this number left North West Mayo on 15 ships from Black Sod Bay situated about 11 miles from Belmullet. Here is local historian Rosemary Geraghty of the Unadervla Heritage Centre situated in Auclaim Blacksod in County Mayo to talk about the Atlantic ship voyage which the Chuke emigrants from Blacksod had to make. It would often take about 12 to 14 days and of the 15 ships that left Blacksod Bay 
12 of them called to Galway Bay to pick up the Clifton and Uthrad emigrants. So all the Chuuk emigrants that were all together on the same ship heading over to the New World. And even on board the ship, on um, three of the crossings, um, a baby was born. And actually all girls, you know, on three, three different sailings. He hired ships of the beaver line to take the needy folk to Canada and Boston far away. Arranging friends to meet them there and help them to find work for a better life and to live a better way. And then when they landed in Boston or in Canada, they were then met uh, by certain people who, who would have arranged uh, the work for them. And so they could have been put on a train then and the train fare pay, pay to, say, St. Paul's or Ohio or maybe on the East Coast as well. There were a lot of them. Historian John Johnson. Here's Rosemary Gerty once again to further explain how things went for the Chuuk emigrants in the New World. They were ticketed to their destination, so they weren't left friendless in the ports when they got there. And even on the ship's manifest, it would state that they were going to a son or a daughter or cousins. There was somebody there before them. And um, in some cases also, it would say that they were ticketed to... um, well, in one case or a few cases, to a Father Mahoney in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, that would be their friend. In other cases, work had been secured for them. People that left on the SS Phoenician, they were ticketed to Grosvenor Dale Mills in Connecticut to a, a Mr. Briggs, who was the superintendent there, and work had been secured for them. So every, well, mostly everything was thought out for them, you know, to, to help them get along. The Chuuk Fund helped 9,000 to escape starvation's grip Where landlords didn't care if tenants died He helped dispel the rumours that the things were not so bad And soon saw through horrendous myths and lies He was born to help the poorest and the needy His parents, they were all so true and kind He never stopped in helping with compassion every day To give the less well of some peace of mind What is noticeable is that those who were sent out from Clifton in 1882 and from the other poor law unions in 1883 are now sending letters back, urging friends and relations that if the opportunity arises for them to be able to leave, to avail of it, to go to Chuuk. So what you have is the initiation of a chain migration process, which had been lacking in these particular areas right up to 1882, now being put in place. Historian Jerry Morn. And here is historian Joan Johnson to give an example of the type of letters which the Chuuk emigrants were sending back to Ireland. Here's one. Uh, it says, Dear brother, if there is any reason for you to come out here on the first emigration that leaves that part of the country, I would feel very happy to see you out. For this reason that I, th- I think that you will do well in this country. St. Paul's is the best place in the country for an immigrant to come to. There is more work to be done here this summer than has been for the last 15 years, so don't miss the first opportunity to come out or any other friend that is in the country where you will have a share to make a fortune. Show this letter to Mr. Chuuk. Now, Mr. Chuuk would be looking through all, uh, for the applications. Uh, we think he will favour your quest to pass you out to us in St. Paul's, Minnesota. So that's one one good, uh, encouraging letter. And 
what was happening then? The first Clifton gang, as it were, went out and were writing back, encouraging, telling them the news that things were going well. They got their jobs within two or three days. Uh, they were up and running, mainly labouring jobs, and the women were working in the houses. And they say how much they were getting, which was an enormous amount compared to what they were earning here. They were also, and the second important thing, was they were starting to send money back to their mothers or fathers or who, who they had left in, in Darwant here. Over a three-year period from 1882 to 1884, the English Quaker James Duke assisted over 9,000 Irish people to leave Ireland for a new life in North America. Now before we hear what caused his assisted emigration scheme to eventually stop, first it's worth briefly investigating how the lives of Duke's emigrants progressed in the new world. Historian Regina Donnellan. Once they got there then they entered the American host society at the very lowest levels and so most of the employment they found were as day labourers or um, as helpers to some kinds, to, to, to tradesmen, so plumbers, helpers and, and day labourers. There were examples then over time of how families began to gain social mobility and climb the social ladder. There's a very good example of the Barrett family. They left um, Belmullet on the SS Austrian on the 25th of May 1883 and they uh, they emigrated to Minneapolis in Minnesota. And by 1900 then, uh, the couple continued to have four more children. So Thomas, Anna, Julia and Anthony were all born in Minnesota. But um, of the initial immigrants that made the trip with their parents, um, Patrick, for example, in 1900 is recorded as being uh, at a seminary in St. Louis, Missouri. So he's obviously training to to be a priest. And there was another example then of his sister, uh, Julia. She was born in 1889. So she was one of the the second uh, family, if you like, the American part of the family. And um, by 1910, she's actually recorded as working as a stenographer. So even though she's not an immigrant herself, she's obviously come from a a very much an Irish-American background. And her family, you know, they would have been of a certain socio-economic level uh, at the turn of the 20th century and so the fact that Julia was able to penetrate these higher occupations uh, makes makes her quite a, a good example of how social mobility could be achieved by the immigrants and their families. And historian Jerry Morn once again shares his views. We know one of the Chuk immigrants who leaves in 1883 from Clifton that the reports in 1889 indicate that he has now got a property portfolio worth $90,000. So this was at a time when Minnesota and St. Paul was burgeoning, business was booming, and in particular in relation to real estate. But here was one individual who probably would never have been able to achieve the stream if it hadn't been for his passage being paid by the Chuk Committee to go to Minnesota. There's another example of a family um, whose grandson, um, their daughter Bridget, married uh, an American citizen uh, called McFarland, and uh, their grandson Fred actually became part of the U.S. Navy. And uh, so in in 1910, he's actually recorded as living in San Francisco. And again, this is quite a migration for for one branch of the family to move from Minnesota right as far as the West Coast uh, to San Francisco. And historian Rosemary Gerty of the Unadervla Heritage Centre in Blacksod, County Mayo, had this pertinent comment to make. Even in the um, 1900 census of America, a lot of the families, 17 years later, are still together. And the ones will say that went to Grosnevar Dale Mills in Connecticut, on the census, they're, they're turning up there as having um, textile industry related jobs you know they went on in that field and they continued on in that kind of work we do know that the mayor of st paul in minnesota between 1940 and 1950 one james mcdonough was the son of seamus mcdonough who went out on one of the boats from carrow in 
1883. As was mentioned earlier, over the three-year period from 1882 to 1884, James Chuke helped nearly 9,500 Irish people to emigrate from the poorest areas in the west of Ireland to North America. Now, despite the phenomenal success of his assisted emigration scheme, nevertheless, forces outside Chuke's control eventually caused the scheme to stop. Jerry Morn. In 1884, there is a realization, you know, sort of that the scheme is uh, ha- is not going to be able to continue. You know, uh, there are a variety of reasons. First of all, the opposition of very influential groups in our society. The first group from 1883, who are now targeting Chuk and the fact that British government money is involved in the immigration schemes, is the Irish Parliamentary Party. When it is set up in 1882 the schemes. They did not demand that much notice, largely on account of the fact that there were so many other things happening in Ireland at this particular time. This was the time that Parnell and most of the leaders of the land agitation were in prison in Kilmainham, the issuing of the No Rent Manifesto from Kilmainham. But this was the period as well, in May, when the groups were actually sent out, that the Chief Secretary and Under Secretary, Burke and Cavendish, were assassinated by the Invincibles in Phoenix Park. So that the, when it's, you know, the schemes are actually set up, the politicians, their you know, focus is on other areas and other things. But in 1883, when the schemes get government money, now is the time that Parnell, who is the undisputed leader of the Irish Parliamentary Party, where you know, he's now concentrating on political issues rather than the agrarian question, now focuses increasingly um, and being critical in relation to the immigration schemes that are taking place. So you have the condemnation which has taken place on a continuous basis. Secondly, the Catholic Church and Catholic bishops, in particular in the west of Ireland, become very critical of the schemes, maintaining that these people are being sent out to areas in which their Catholic faith is under threat. You have pastoral letters written by the Archbishop of Toom, John McEvely, the Bishop of Galway, Thomas Carr, Patrick Duggan, the Bishop of Clanfert, and Francis McCormack in O'Connery. And these are all in the areas where the assisted immigration schemes of Chuuk are very, very important. Now, what it means is that the parish priests and the local clergy, who had previously been very helpful to Chuuk in the whole process in the areas that he was working in, they could no longer engage with Chuk. Now, what we do find is that there are some priests who do it unofficially on account of the fact what they feel is that it is more important, you assert, that their parishioners are helped to get a better life than leave them in the dire poverty that they will be in if they remain in the west of Ireland. Opposition to James Chuke's scheme also came from the local Board of Guardians, which were now controlled by the Irish Parliamentary Party, and also local shop owners. The net result was that in 1884, James Chuke had no choice but to end the scheme. Joan Johnson. But certainly on the third year, there was a decline in the number of applicants, and he felt he couldn't go on any longer. And the committee then decided to stop this particular scheme and he was very, very disappointed. So just how valid was the opposition of the Irish Parliamentary Party, Jerry Moore? The main reason for the opposition of the Irish Parliamentary Party was government involvement. Because the one thing that you have to remember is that while politicians can tell people not to emigrate, people will always vote with their feet. And if it's in their best interests, they will go. But the Irish Parliamentary Party and the Land League, there was opposition to what was considered forced immigration. Because the idea was that people were not going voluntarily, which is not the case 
because all you have to do is look at the sources and uh, not just alone the sources from the uh, you're from the Chook. But if you look at some of the Nationalist newspapers in 1882, you know, the Galway Vindicator actually comes straight out and says, you know, sort of that these people are going to a better life. And it basically summed it up. But what you have to remember as well is that the Irish Parliamentary Party, many of them did not really have a clear sense of what life was like in areas like Mayo and, and Galway. Chuk was irate because there was uh, letters going to the papers about it uh, over in, in England and people objecting and you know he felt that these people were were really making decisions about a, sort of a policy of whether it was good or bad and they didn't even know what the conditions were like he was horrified he had gone in uh, over I mean every year he'd gone back and he had seen these especially the evictions he said at one stage he went over and he he saw I think it was 20 evictions and to actually stand and see the people having been put out of their houses and being put onto the side of the road and really he called what they were living in they had made temporary little hovels he called them bog houses and he described them and how, how on earth they could ever live and that he was irate really that, that these people were were against couldn't provide uh, nobody was providing the government wasn't providing for the uh, weren't giving enough money and he felt well this fund at least was helping to give um, and y- you had to apply you had to want to go it wasn't a sort of a, an obligatory thing uh, so you had a choice Joan Johnson and it's also worth asking just how valid were certain church claims that Chuke's scheme involved proselytising Jerry Morn this idea of proselytising, I don't agree, actually took place. It is more or less a propaganda issue that is put in. If we look at the numbers that are sent, and there is in the region of about 1,200 of these immigrants sent to Minnesota, and they're sent to Bishop John Ireland of St. Paul, uh, who goes out of his way to send the immigrants to parishes in which there is a Catholic priest, such as Father Michael O'Mahony, who goes with one of the first groups of Chuk immigrants from Galway and accompanies them to Minnesota. So that they are looked after in that way. I'll give you another example. There are two families, the Dicey and the Gohan families, who leave from Balmullet and who are sent to Richmond in Indiana to a father Macmillan, purely on account of the fact that he will look after them. And while the Chuke scheme halted in 1884, James Chuke himself never let up in his efforts to help impoverished people in the west of Ireland. Over the next five years, he privately assisted around 200 people to emigrate to North America. Also, when the 1885 potato harvest failed, James Chuke once again came to the rescue by helping to purchase and distribute massive quantities of seed potato in order to help stave off hunger for many West of Ireland families. Over the next few years, he also continually lobbied the British government to try and improve fisheries, industry and infrastructure in the West. Joan Johnson. But James Chuke... That Chuke fund stopped, but he didn't stop himself and he continued to uh, write. He wrote to the, the British government and said that something needed to be done for the West still. And he was writing continually to, to Mr Balfour. Balfour was trying to set up this... Balfour contest. would have been the Prime Minister of today. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, Balfour was, was uh, working on the Congested District Board and um, Chuke was feeding him his ideas about what to do and try to help and he felt very strongly on a number of issues in, in the development of the fisheries, development of transport. Sounds like modern, <laughs> modern uh, infrastructure there at that stage and um, the land question. And Anyway, the Congested District Board was set up in 1891 and Duke was the only English man on 
that board. So he was asked to serve on that and he served and he served on two committees, the fisheries and the land committees. But he also had campaigned for the railway development and would have given in to the government his observations and campaigned for the development because he really felt that, for example, in Clifton, and I I remember reading this, they had a a nice market, but they had no way of transporting the produce to even Galway or Dublin. And he would have been so pleased to have seen eventually the Galway Clifton line opened um, when it did and to the other infrastructure. Uh, so he was always promoting uh, for the remedies uh, and the development of, of the West from, the, the, from Donegal right down to, to Galway. During the 1890s, James Chuke's health deteriorated and in the year 1896 he died and went to his maker, historian Brendan Oscanall. He died in 1896. I I mean, as I say, he had been working for so many years on, on the west of Ireland. He probably had worn himself out on it in a sense, but he died in 1896 and he was uh, buried in Hitching, Hitching in Hertfordshire. It was a very big funeral and uh, at Hitchin representatives of the board, Irish local government and the Land Commission were amongst those who t- attended his simple Quaker funeral. Quaker James H. Chuke poured his time, energies and monies into helping Ireland and the Irish. So what is his ultimate legacy? Richard Lemaire, a fifth generation descendant of the Barrett family who emigrated on the Chuke scheme from County Mayo to the United States in 1883, gives his opinion. This man took through his heart and soul and perseverance and fundraising. He rescued thousands of our of Irish, including my family, from a a life of hopeless misery and squalor. He was a man, I believe, who was driven in his quest to free these people, recognizing that there was a fresh start in the growing countries of Canada and the United States, and it was a better way to go. As far as I'm concerned, he changed, in my own family, he changed lives for seven generations on my mother's side and my family's. I have just started to touch upon how important his being there at this time meant to what I call them refugees. I call them refugees because they did come from a war, their own war with life. And he is the one who saved them and brought them over here. I said to my grandmother, I said, how come they went to Pennsylvania? She said, sure, the boat got lost. It was supposed to have gone to Boston. But they went from Boston to Pennsylvania because Martin's son had already emigrated from Ireland in uh, 1860. I found that out. But these these people suffered when they got here. I mean, it wasn't an easy road for them to hoe. They had religious problems. People didn't want them because of their Catholicity. And they fought for their due rights as Americans. They unionized. They did. They sent their children to schools, to colleges and universities, bettering themselves all the way. They owned their own businesses. They became doctors. I became a teacher. I was the first one in my family to finish university. The religious people, the, the nuns and the priests, the, the schools, and they became famous athletes from Mayo and politicians, as you well know. And James Took. Well, he's the one who provided that for them. Do 
Chuuk's ultimate legacy is is his humanitarianism. I think there's a lesson there to be learned for everybody. Historian Regina Donlan. This is somebody that had absolutely no reason to take an interest in these um, poor people in the west of Ireland, and because of his innovation and his 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 forward thinking, if you like, because of the two schemes, there's a colossal number of Irish Americans that can claim um, ancestry to these immigrants, and so that in itself is an amazing achievement and, and a testament to the legacy of Chuuk's innovation. All thanks to the efforts of this English Quaker, because he dreamed and struggled, really, to bring these souls with no real hope of escaping their plight and misery. Seven generations in my family of Americans are his descendants, the descent from a man whose wish was to, to take thousands of Irish from squalor and hopelessness. Here again, during a time of crisis, that somebody is prepared to give up everything. Historian Jerry Morn. Not for any personal gain, not to be made famous, but on account of the fact his philanthropy towards his fellow man was so important to him that he was prepared between 1880 and 1885 alone to come to Ireland on eight different occasions and spent well over half of that period in Ireland to the exclusion of his own business interests, that the sense of looking after his fellow man and looking after what was best for them is probably the epitaph. The biggest thing that I get out of him and his life was he was a Quaker, and that's what Quakers are supposed to do. And he, he was loyal to his faith, and he did what... Quakers do. They're friends. That's what we call them over here. The organization, the religious organization, they're called friends. They're only interested in, in the good of man and helping man. And I think he exemplified that very, very much to the point. This program was made with the support of the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland. James Hack Chuuk, he always sought to address starvation and deprivation in the west of Ireland. The compassion throughout, he just didn't dismiss Irish people as feckless, he could see they were damaged by the way the country was governed, and he could only see the solution to make room for people, but to give people a better life somewhere else. This was the solution that saved people's lives. James Hack Chuuk. His compassion for Ireland. This is somebody that had absolutely no reason to take an interest in these poor people in the west of Ireland. He had nothing to gain from it. A man like that had such an influence on people and that he cared. He was a man that showed kindness, concern for his fellow man and woman. A very kind and caring person. A wonderful story of somebody English, somebody part of the British establishment, uh, that was actually kind and caring. So here is our Englishman now who has come in and helped us.